I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Meredith Jenkins, the Chief Investment Officer of Trinity Wall Street, where she oversees $5.5 billion in the church's endowment and real estate assets. Before taking over as Trinity's first CIO, Meredith was co-CIO of Carnegie Corporation towards the end of a long time, 17 years in fact, that she spent at Carnegie of New York. Earlier in her career, she started in investment banking at Goldman Sachs and Sanford Bernstein in research and is a graduate of the University of Virginia and the Harvard Business School. Meredith currently sits on the investment committee of the Wenner-Gren Foundation and the board of directors of the University of Virginia Investment Management Company. Our conversation starts with Meredith's early career lessons and discusses important investment issues she learned along the way, including alignment of interest, standing by managers in difficult times, markers of success, manager research in Asia, the co-CIO structure at Carnegie, and governance in her new challenge of starting an investment office from scratch. Fun-loving and smart as attack, Meredith offers pearls of wisdom throughout our conversation. This week, I'd like to encourage you to sign up for my mailing list. You can find it at capitalallocatorspodcast.com right at the homepage. I've started writing a column for Institutional Investor Magazine, and I'd love to share those with you as they come available. Please enjoy my conversation with Meredith Jenkins. Meredith, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you. What early investment lessons did you learn from your days at Goldman and Sanford Bernstein in the early years of your career? Well, Goldman, I got sort of my first view of investing at working on roadshows and going to visit managers and getting to sit in and hear what kind of questions they asked. What were those roadshows like? <laughs> well, they were crazy when you're an analyst, right? Because you're, <laughs> you're carrying all the books and you're worried, you know, a couple of them were in the winter and you're worried about the snow and whether you're going to get to where you need to be. And, you know, you're in L.A. and someone's in Santa Monica and someone's on the other side of L.A. and they're screaming at you because you had no idea that those places were so far apart. And <laughs> it was miserable. It was pretty miserable, actually. <laughs> but like the, the lights during the day of really interesting things were when you would be at the managers and they would, you know, they'd be pressing you like crazy because we're you're taking something public which after having worked at Bernstein in my mind when you're taking something public it's probably not a value option a value play <laughs> right you're taking you're trying to take advantage of of getting a good price in the market for the person who's selling their equity not buying it and so you know so you go in these meetings and people will be very skeptical and they'd ask really tough questions and so that was just really interesting to see that so I want to and they also you know when you're an analyst and you're you're on the road show, your life is pretty miserable. And those people looked like they had pretty good lives. <laughs> so, so I was did, interested um, in, in that, did, too. How did you first get to Goldman? Was that just a standard interviewing process out of school? A standard interviewing process. I think what had happened, so I graduated in 93, and I think the market was kind of um, stronger than people thought it was going to be. And so they ended up doing a round of liberal arts majors because they needed more analysts than they went into the season thinking they needed. And so I was lucky. I, I know for sure I was in the last group of candidates, you know, in the last <laughs> day that they had analyst candidates we in. All, and we all think we were in the last, no, the last group, the last admitted. The, yeah, we go. <laughs> English major from UVA was not sort of top of the target list. But so I ended up in the, you know, it was just regular sort of analyst program. And like many analyst programs, they were very willing to sort of take a chance on, we'll teach you. You don't necessarily need to have come out of school knowing what all this is and how to do uh, you know, a DCF or a common stock comparison or whatever the case may be. And so I did that. And I figured, you know, I did, when I was coming out of undergrad, I didn't, wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to live in New York City, but wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And so I looked at being an analyst as like, 
another two years of school in some ways and that I would just I would learn as much as possible from it. And and it was a great learning experience in that regard, perhaps most because I learned I didn't want to do investment banking longer term. But I made some of, you know, the greatest friends in my life. And, you know, at that time, so from 93 to 95, for people coming out of analyst programs then, it was just, you know, a huge growth in asset management broadly, private equity, hedge funds, everything. And so all these people I worked with have gone on to unbelievable fame and fortune and stature. And so, you know, it was great to be surrounded by really smart people and and to learn from them and to see them go on to such success. And so you saw a slightly better lifestyle on the other side of the desk. Yes. And ended up going to Bernstein. Yeah. So I ended up going to Bernstein. And I think that probably was most formative in terms of investment philosophy. The value orientation of Bernstein back at that time just really resonated with me. And, and to, and (laughs) interesting. Interestingly, as an English major, to to look at a stock and try and figure out the story of what is the market not understanding that we think we understand better, there, that's like a thesis. And that's sort of, you know, trying to prove your thesis and spending a ton of time with management and other investors and sell side and what are the stories that people think are out there. And so that was a great experience. And, and the, the discipline of, okay, here's the story on the stock. Here's what the market's missing. And this is what our thesis is. And so that was, that, there was, a, that was great experience in terms of thinking about investment opportunity. And I was lucky I had, you know, I worked for, actually I worked for two different people. My first year I worked for Deborah Fine and was doing more consumer oriented stuff and, you know, these crazy models on what's the world supply and demand for sneakers and sweatshirts. And so that was, you know, there was great to sort of just understand big data and how to kind of look at it and, and, and stay on top of it. She was a great investor and she was phenomenal and is phenomenal in terms of having the discipline of here's what the story is, but being willing, if it wasn't playing out as we were in it, to revisit what's going wrong here, what don't we understand. And so um, so that was great to learn from her. And then my second year, I worked for a guy named Andrew Maloff, who was doing more commodities type stuff, aluminum and some of the metals. And so that was a really great experience because those are so pure supply and demand. The, the consumer supply and demand, there's a bit of a guess as to what what that'll be and there's sort of you know their their fads and all of that stuff that's hard to take account for whereas you know the metals and all that stuff there that's sort of it plays the same way over and over again so that was really valuable and when did you think about shifting over to sort of multi-asset allocation so actually it was completely serendipity and i had been doing a lot outside of work in terms of fundraising and i was involved with my undergraduate institution and just i was interested in the nonprofit sector broadly speaking alongside that at that time at bernstein mr bernstein still used to send out articles that he would cut it was like your grandparents send you articles that they cut <laughs> out of the newspaper mr bernstein would send those out They'd be these b notes and then he would send them out and he was really into a number of kind of more philanthropic things. And um, I always loved reading these various articles that he had found. And so I was just broadly interested in the nonprofit sector and what could I do that would be more meaningful. There was that plus this combination of I worked with some phenomenally great investors, really smart people. And they would come in and be like, oh, man, when I was taking a shower this morning, I was thinking about this with this stock. And when I was taking a shower, I was not thinking about any of my <laughs> stocks. <laughs> so I knew like I was it was intellectually challenging, and I really liked that part of it, but I did not go to bed and wake up thinking about my stocks. I was just never that passionate about them. And so I, I just sort of came to the conclusion I was never going to be as good as a lot of these people that I worked with who really, truly did live and breathe their stocks. And so so I was interested in learning more about nonprofit. And I had gotten into the program at HBS to start in January, so I wasn't going to have the summer. So I went to HBS and said, I really want to try and do an internship in the fall, Broadly interested in the nonprofit world, any thoughts would be helpful. And so they, being HBS at that time, said, oh, there's a firm that uh, is a gatekeeper for a lot of uh, nonprofits. Maybe you should talk to them. And there were a couple HBS grads there. And so I ended up doing an internship at Cambridge Associates. And that was the serendipity of this is what I really like to do. There are a couple things from that experience. I, I was up in Boston since I was getting ready to move up to Boston for business school. And 
because of that, all, most of the managers would come through the Boston office. And so I got to sit in on these manager meetings and see how Cambridge would question the managers. And the combination of seeing that and then also knowing what I knew from Bernstein about how we managed, it just, I, I found that fascinating to try and judge whether people had sort of a sustainable advantage and discipline in thinking about how they invested. So that all was really fascinating to me. And clicked for me in one sense. And then the other thing that clicked for me was to think about things at a portfolio level and, and asset classes and how do they all fit together rather than it, it just that was just much more intellectually fitting for me than to think about a stock portfolio and how you would put together 15 or 20 names or whatever the case might be. Is it all that much different? I mean, there maybe there are more line items in a sense, but I get that if you're not living, eat, eating, living, breathing stocks, you might worry about whether you're going to be the best research analyst, but you could also have similar disciplines in terms of portfolio construction. There are absolutely similar disciplines in terms of kind of managing risk and understanding what, you know, what your various exposures are and how, how much you feel comfortable and confident in something. But I really loved, after having worked at Bernstein for a couple of years, I did really love judging the underlying investment management organization and whether I thought that. And I, I found that much more interesting than, you know, judging a steel business and whether I thought they had a competitive advantage. So you left school and went to Carnegie. So uh, when I was coming out of school, I was very focused on finding something in this in the endowment and foundation world. And so I did a ton of networking and was lucky enough through some of that networking to to be connected with David Swenson. And then David Swenson connected me with um, a former colleague of his who had just left to go be the first CIO at Carnegie. And so um, that just seemed like an amazing opportunity to be somewhere on the ground floor, getting, you know, learning the portfolio as she was building out her team. Actually, the other piece of it, too, I was really, really motivated by what Carnegie was doing on the program side. And so Vartan Gregorian had recently joined in, you know, in the prior couple of years as their new president. And so you know, I, I left my interviews with them with a whole pile of kind of work, strategic work he had done on what program areas he was going to be focusing on. And so Carnegie focuses on education, international peace and security, and strengthening U.S. democracy, which has included things like campaign finance reform, supporting immigration reform, and, and, you know, civic engagement and bringing immigra- immigrants into the civic process in the U.S. And all those things resonated so much with me that, that the combination of the day-to-day of what my work would be looking really interesting and it benefiting these unbelievable things that meant so much to me, it was an ideal combination. What investment beliefs did you learn at Carnegie and how similar are they or different from what you thought you knew when you got there? I learned a lot about understanding manager alignment, which I probably hadn't been as sensitive to before. I just hadn't really thought about it. And that was something that Ellen was great about kind of emphasizing when we looked at managers and trying to understand how well aligned they were with us or not. What I learned from Ellen was in a couple of, we had a couple of instances in the portfolio where we had the chance to really kind of stand by a manager, either giving them more capital at a difficult time or sticking with them as they went through some organizational challenges. And the value that that added to our relationship, our long-term relationship with those managers and Ellen's willingness to really stand up and kind of partner with our managers. I mean, that's at the core of what I try to do now. And that was something I really learned from her. Those are kind of the most interesting decision point moments with a manager, right? Yeah. So the experiences that you had going through that, was there a commonality of the ones where you stayed and it worked versus ones when you stayed and a few years later realize that one didn't work out the way we'd hoped? Right. But I do think, you know, to the extent that we had done our homework and we really felt confident that we understood how a manager did what they did and what their processes were and how disciplined they were. So to the extent we were disciplined in our process, to understand the discipline in their process, that those tended to work out. And the other circumstances, you know, that that tended to work out back to sort of the alignment is the when we could point to examples of when a manager did something that was either personally or economically painful to them and their firm to, to do right by their LPs. 
or mm-hmm. their investors. And so, you know, didn't take the carry for a long time, even though by rights in the document, they could have taken the carry and did what they could to ultimately, at the end of the day, get great returns for them and their investors. Yeah. And did it differ across asset classes? Actually, I would say it didn't. You know, I, I, I think it's, it's too easy to say. There are all sort of the various easy things you can say about venture capital or hedge funds and that, you know, the mindset is more sort of that, that the manager ultimately takes care of themselves. And, and, and there are absolutely examples out there and, you know, that they get bigger and they do all these things that mess up the alignment with their LPs. But for the good managers who don't do that, I think you can find them in every asset class. So we've got alignment. We've got being supportive at tough times. Are there any other big ones? I think the other thing that I learned, I came in in some ways very dogmatic because that was what worked really well at Bernstein and sort of the discipline and this is the way we look at things and that was it, it, it worked very well for for them. Um, and I in the sort of in the multi asset world um, and as I worked with different team members over the year over the years, I think I really learned the value of having people with different perspectives and experiences and that that, that actually can benefit a portfolio significantly. Yeah. You know, I used to struggle with that double-edged sword because on the one hand, you want to be open to different perspectives and on the other, then how do you know right. what Let's, to filter out, right? Yeah, yeah. So how, how did you balance going from, okay, if it's, if it's U.S. equity investing, you like value managers and a certain style of rigor and fundamental analysis to, oh... Yeah, but out, that growth can be good, or maybe it's value and momentum. Or, so how do you calibrate, really, when you're broadening out what you know, are different ways to succeed? You know, I think, I mean, you, you look, again, you look for sort of the markers that perhaps should ultimately transcend some of that stuff. And so what, is, what sort of partners have these, manage, have these managers been? What kind of access do they have to really interesting investment opportunities? How creative have they been over time? And how has that worked out for them? As much as I'm sort of a true value-oriented person, I think, you know, yeah, in growth, you can find people who actually do a great job on their, con- their companies, and they're really thoughtful about the underlying dynamics of what they're invested in, and they're respected by the managers at the companies that they're invested with such that they can provide real value add, and that can kind of s- transcend value versus growth. Yeah, and- yeah. I'm going to turn a little bit. You spent a couple of years in Asia. Yeah. What was different about the hunt for talented managers across asset classes when you're in Asia than in the U.S.? Well, it was a lot more Wild West in many ways. So we were there from 2007 to 2011. So <laughs> clearly an interesting time in the global financial markets to, um, to be there. We got there just on the edge of sort of the craziness that happened from 03 to 08 in terms of, you know, private equity was, was exploding. Venture capital was exploding. Uh, hedge funds were exploding. And they were doing all sorts of stuff that maybe they might not have been doing in the era before that and, and that they maybe got called out for doing in 2008 and 2009. But so it was just a really, really interesting time to be there for that. Underwriting opportunities and who you wanted to partner with was the the personal side of it became even tougher because there was so much massive turnover and, you know, turnover in terms of people for sure. And so, you know, and, and this is I'd gotten I'd gotten very used to in New York with the Carnegie team, you know, spending a ton of time getting to know the teams and feeling and, and coming to a conclusion of, OK, are we, are we comfortable in the stability of this team? Are we comfortable that they're going to be good partners and we can trust them? And and then over there, you know, people were constantly leaving and, and kind of maximizing their market value and going to another firm and you know, spending a year here and then a year there. And and you had to spend a lot more time understanding when you did back something, understanding the whole team. You you had to go into it assuming there would be turnover. And so you'd have to take the extra time to really make sure you felt comfortable with everyone on the team so that you could make, because you would inevitably at some point probably have to make an assessment of was that guy valuable or not? Because he's leaving. And so A, is that what expo- what is what risk is that exposing us to and what we're already in? And B, should we be following him? Because he's yeah. actually really quite good. And what did you see with other allocators? I used to refer to going to Asia as like flyby or jet lag due diligence. So you'd go in for a week, you'd be half asleep in most of your meetings, and then all of a sudden you have to make decisions. What did you see when other allocators came about what they might miss from not being on the ground consistently? 
there were so many bodies that were buried <laughs> that I, you know, I just, I know I never saw before when I would fly in for those weeks. And, and I, it, it's almost impossible. The stuff you heard about over lunch, just sort of randomly, you weren't even necessarily doing diligence on a particular manager. And someone would be like, oh, yeah, that guy during the 98 crisis, he did this and totally screwed all his investors. And, you, you know, you just, it, it sort of got buried in the history and they refashioned themselves and now they were the next hot thing. And I just realized that many times over as I was there and sort of just sitting and, you know, having lunch with people or or catching up with someone on something that wasn't even necessarily supposed to be diligence on a manager or an opportunity and things that would come up were just, oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah, so we'll we'll get full-blown to what you're doing now, but I'm really curious about how do you think about investing in Asia today now that you're back here full-time? It's tough. It's really tough. And so I can't tell you how many times <laughs> between coming back in 2011 and now where I've had the feeling of it'd be so nice to have someone on the ground that you knew was sort of in the middle of all those flows and you trusted. And so I do what I can to leverage the people I do know who who are over there and on the ground and that I, you know, or it's a smaller community over there. So it was a really, in many ways, that was nice that we all sort of had each other. It was this community of people who had connections to some sort of U.S. firm and they tended to be more allocatory type things. And um, so I've tried to to maintain those so that when we look at stuff, we can do a little bit more targeted uh, diligence, uh, off <laughs> off reference sheet targeted diligence. And then there, that is much more of a, I go with my gut in terms of, do I feel comfortable with this person? Do I really feel like if the chips were down, this person would do right by us? And versus I feel like sometimes in the U.S. you might be more willing to, okay, we can structure this in a way that will be protected if it doesn't. And it's and we know how it would play out sort of in a U.S. legal system and all of that sort of in terms of, of kind of risk management over there. I think you you need to be very, very comfortable with the people that you ultimately are partnering with. So sometime after you came back, you were named Mm co-CIO when Ellen left. Yep. I'm curious to learn a little bit about the strengths and challenges of a structure like that when Kim and you were in those seats. In that seat together. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so that was why I came back, actually. So Ellen had announced she was leaving in the summer of 2011. And so that was she had announced at the beginning of the summer. And so over the course of the summer, Kim and I were being interviewed and they were deciding whether they would think about going with internal candidates or uh, looking externally. And before sort of in the middle of the summer, they made the decision that they wanted to the, the, both of us to be uh, co-CIOs. And um, there were a couple of people on the search Committee who were familiar with a co co head type model and were and they thought were former Goldman Sachs people. exactly <laughs> exactly and so they were they were familiar with this co head model and and when it works well that it can can be very strong and so they had suggested it and I and I would say Kim and I and probably others were kind of skeptical and how is this going to work and you know there's in contrast to the strengths that can be in that model there's also there can be a natural instability in that model and you know each person's trying to and maybe trying to prove themselves and whatever the case may be. So Kim and I talked a lot about it. And um, in some ways, I would say to their credit, to the search committee's credit, they they said, look, you know, this is what we think would work best, having spent a ton of time with both of you, having gotten to know you in the context of your roles at, in the organization already. Um, we think there's, there are, in many ways, you're complimentary. And, but, you know, you guys think it out and think how it might work. And so so we had, um, we had the chance to really sit down and kind of think through, okay, how would this be? structured and you know we we tried to give we tried to be very deliberate about making it not too duplicative so that you know it wasn't she and I doing everything but that there were things that we were we were overlapping on in a way that would be additive for for the team and the portfolio so so the non duplicative stuff we kind of we split the world in terms of um, rather than splitting asset classes we sh- she had done so much on this side of the world and I had done so much over on that side of the world having been in Hong Kong for the prior four years we tried 
tried to kind of use that as the guidance. And so I ended up, I was the primary on everything in emerging markets on that side of the world. So not Latin America, but everything else across portfolio, public, private. And then I was the primary on real estate um, and natural resources, which tended to have some some nice connections with emerging markets. And then um, then I was also the primary on uh, the, uh, the opportunistic part of our marketable alternatives portfolio. And, then, and so that tended to be more credit oriented, some multi-strat, not, just not the long short. And so then Kim was the primary on everything else. So we weren't both looking at managers and ultimately we were supporting the team. It was really the day-to-day people on the team who were, who were really digging deep on the managers, but then she or I, depending on where in the portfolio it was, would be the support to that person and kind of, you know, helping them do the diligence, meeting the managers and being the faces that they saw at Carnegie. And then the, so the, then the other person between Kim and I would be the secondary. And so the secondary's role was a built-in devil's advocate. And so the secondary, you know, anytime anything new, or re-up or we were just sort of re-examining a manager for some reason, the secondary's role would be, okay, can we, is there another way we could do this? Is there, is there something that's more liquid? Is there something that's more attractively structured or better returns or the type of exposure this is going to give us? It, would it be somewhere else in the portfolio? It might be better and sort of just trying to kind of punch holes. It's kind of interesting for that to happen at the most senior level because it's often the case that it's the CIO and then the other people on their team are trying to bring up their ideas. And if the CIO doesn't love the idea, then they're constantly the negative reinforcement loop, which can get tiring. Yeah. Well, and it was so I think it worked very well with both Kim and my personality. I mean, we had Carnegie has a great experienced team. And so, you know, so our structure, and I know many, many structures are this way where it's sort of, oh, well, the CIO doesn't like it. You know, I think we were much more sort of the opposite of, I mean, we had to get comfortable with stuff for sure, but we started at the point of we trusted our team's judgment on what they brought to us. And, you know, and they knew also, you know, they, they needed to do a bit of their legwork before it got to, to, to Kim and I. And so that, you know, things that, things that came to us were not half baked things. And where was it tricky? Oh, and actually, I'll say, sorry, I'll say one other thing that was great, uh, or that was really nice that I miss a lot. You know, there's a, Ellen always uh, said, there's a lot of not investing that goes with being a CIO. And what Kim and I did for all that sort of stuff was, so, you know, on like performance management and tough conversations and all that sort of stuff, we shared the burden on that. And we always did all of that together. But it was really nice to have someone to <laughs> to talk about that and prep. And OK, yeah. here's how we're going to handle it. How do you think they're going to respond? And oh, no, this is great news. And we both get to give this great news together. And so it was that was really nice. And then, you know, then there's stuff like the annual audit. So we took turns and I did it one year and she did it the next year. And so you'd have a year off that you didn't have to do all the audit confirms and making sure everything was coming in and this sort of mind numbing getting to the managers, please give us this information. <laughs> so the other point I didn't make, which I, I think is really important and that I try to always make is it was not an arranged marriage. I mean, Kim and I had worked together for a long time before that. And so, and I mean, we had worked together long before Carnegie because she did private equity at Ford and I was doing private equity at Carnegie and we underwrote a bunch of managers together. She was, you know, one of my good friends. And when Ellen was looking to kind of fill in on the team when I moved to Hong Kong, I called Kim immediately and said, you should talk to Ellen. (laughs) And so she came over. And so then we truly were working on a team together, but not in sort of the co-CIO's role yet. So we had a great foundation to um, create it. And I can't point out anything that I feel like it didn't work. Like, I I feel like we had a really great working relationship. I have a ton of respect for Kim as an investor and as a manager and a strategist and sort of thinking about portfolios. And I learned a ton from her in all those regards. She's probably much more outgoing and comfortable being that way than I am. And I've, I've learned a lot from that in terms of, okay, just put yourself out there. <laughs> and so that was really, really valuable for me. And so then the opportunity comes up here. Trinity Wall Street, I guess it sold a property. Is that? Well, so they were in the process throughout 2015, much of 2015. They were in the process of 
thinking about taking money off the table on their real estate. So historically, the vast majority of their endowment had been in real estate. And really, it's all in sort of a 10 block radius in downtown Manhattan, um, in an area called Hudson Square, which is north of Tribeca, south of West Village, uh, west of Soho. And it was all these um, turn of the last century buildings with these really big floor plates, high floor to ceilings. They had been, um, a lot of the printers for Wall Street had been there and they had been very industrial at one point. Then they were sort of a value play for a long time. And even coming or in the midst of the crisis in 08, they were kind of the value play in terms of rents. And so they actually were fairly resilient during the crisis. But what had started to happen, and even before the crisis, this had started to happen, there had been a, a, a secular change in the kind of tenants that were there. And so, you know, more media, advertising, technology, and, you know, these, they, the, the floor plates were really suited for big open floor type seating and really light and just modern feeling. And so the rents had gone up. That had done really well. There had always been concern about this very concentrated exposure. They actually had damage in 2012 uh, during Hurricane Sandy. And so there were a number of reasons why it made sense to think about taking some money off the table. And so they went through this process in 2015. It kind of went through a couple different iterations. They ultimately put together 11 of their core commercial buildings and put it into a joint venture, sold 48%, 48% stake to Norges and a 1% stake to Heinz to come in and manage it on a day-to-day basis. And so that produced about uh, $1.7 billion for the portfolio. And so they decided, you know, this is, we should have a real internal investment, investment management effort. And they had also, in the course of that, decided that they would get out of the business of, you know, really managing the buildings on a day-to-day basis. And that was why they brought in Heinz. And so they wanted to kind of think about it more, be more strategic about it, think about the whole portfolio, the risk exposure, and what makes sense over a longer period of time. And so a number of people knew this job was out in the market. I think that people have been talking about it. And it was sort of interesting. I The church my husband and I go to in the West Village had sold a very teeny piece of land, but it was an, it had been a very interesting time for them to sort of think about, okay, and they really did it to guarantee, you know, their long-term sustainability. And it, it had, it had spurred a number of kind of strategic conversations as well as just how do we manage this as good stewards. And so that had all been really interesting to me. And I had mentioned to my husband that this job was out there and said, oh, you should go look at it. And I said, you know what? I'm really happy at Carnegie. I'm not interested. And then kind of a month, a couple months later, the headhunter actually reached out to me directly. And I was like, well, there had been this kernel of that's kind of interesting. Maybe I should just go hear more about it. And as I heard more about it, a number of things really resonated. I mean, you know, the I had been at Carnegie in its early days and the opportunity to really start something from scratch and build a team. And I knew, I know, I think, (laughs) what needs to be done to build something here that could really create long-term value for the church. Um, I was very motivated by a lot of the stuff that the church does from a social justice perspective as, you know, uh, as a a larger member of the larger Anglican communion across the world and as well as a number of projects and things that we do in New York City. Um, that was very appealing. The real estate is just south of where my family lives and where we've really chosen to make our home. And so I, you know, I feel very personal connection to that neighborhood and what it looks like and what we're able to create there. And so there were a number of reasons that it, it just really spoke to me and I was willing to, to go further and further and learning more and more about it. And just all of that sort of coming together, it just, it seemed like a really great opportunity that they don't come along that often. So it's 2015, 2016, and you have a big pile of cash. Okay, well, so I should explain. <laughs> so actually, Goldman Sachs was on as the outsourced CIO, and they came on sort of in 2013, 2014 timeframe. And so this, you know, this transaction had been moving down the road um, over that time period. And so they had been doing a ton of work with the investment committee introducing various managers and, and and giving them thoughts about how to structure the portfolio and all that sort of stuff. So when the money came in in the end of 2015, the, the committee had already given a lot of conversation to, okay, how should we invest this? And so they actually, so it was actually relatively fully invested by the time I got here in April 2016, which actually ended up, it was a great thing because there was still so much going on on the real estate side. If it was truly a pool of cash when I got here in 2016 and 
it would have been tough to deal with. When I left Carnegie, Carnegie was a well-oiled machine. Like it just, and, and it was a very mature portfolio and the vast majority of managers were core managers that we had a lot of confidence in. And if, if they were managers who were on our watch list, we knew exactly why they were on our watch list. And so the day to day there, for me, for everyone else on the team, was much more, okay, what's an interesting opportunity? Where should we spend our time? And it, there was more of a macro element in some ways to it. Not that we, you know, we would always meet with managers and, and we were open to opportunistic things coming in, but we were probably more deliberate about what's interesting now. And as you know, in our world, like, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say this, it hasn't felt like much has been interesting since 2012. <laughs> so, so that always felt like really hard to find what was interesting. And so going straight from that to here, if I had truly had a pool of cash that I needed to invest, I think I would have pulled my hair out because there wasn't anything. <laughs> I don't, there wasn't anything right. that was early 2016, there were a couple things I thought that were interesting back then. Like, so for a few months, there were a couple things that were interesting. And emerging markets, I think, extended a little bit further into 2016. So maybe we would have done a bunch of emerging markets. I do regret perhaps maybe we didn't, we didn't do more of that in retrospect. Though we did um, in, in our, we did a review of the asset allocation with the investment committee and we upped the emerging markets allocation. And so, and that has continued to do well. So that's been great. In some ways, it's been very freeing <laughs> to be in a place where there's, a, we feel like there's a lot that we're doing both both from a team and systems and organization perspective and from a portfolio perspective. You know, we're just, I'm going to manage the portfolio differently than it was set up when the money came in. And so, you know, I have managers that other of my team members have managers that they know and love and have a lot of confidence in. And so we've been doing work on those managers. I would say we don't yet own the portfolio, but there's a lot of stuff in there that we're really excited about that we've been able to put in. And some of it's gotten off to an early great start and some of it's been slower. And, you know, I, it'll be five or six years before we can really look back and say, that's amazing. I don't feel like there's anything right now that feels like first quarter 2009. Like there's one area that I really want to make sure I would say, you know, the the when I think about where our areas our areas of focus are increasing the overall quality of the managers across the portfolio, building up our private exposure, but in no rush to do that, you know, to the extent that we find just really interesting managers who we think are adding value and and um just really great in the areas where they focus and increasing the overall resiliency in the portfolio. I mean, we're, it feels very late cycle. <laughs> and, and we had, when I came here, we had a lot of beta and a lot of passive exposure, which is what you would do when a big pool of money has come in like that. And so getting the passive exposure to managers who we think would do a phenomenal job in a tough environment and uh, increasing the liquidity and just the overall quality of the underlying exposure so that we could hopefully be in a good position to take advantage of something more interesting. Does the overall asset allocation structure look a lot different from the portfolio of Carnegie? Yeah, it does for a number of reasons. So if you take into account the real estate, we still have two thirds of our exposure. Okay, so strip out the real estate. So then. if you take out the real estate, it still looks very different from Carnegie because the private that Trinity did, we did on a much smaller pool of capital. So when the new capital came in, it pushed the private to 1%. Uh, Whereas right. at Carnegie, we had almost 20% in uh, yeah. private equity. Even when I started at Carnegie, we had about 8% in private equity. So, so then does we the got a long way to go. Does the resilience come in from kind of hedge fund strategies? A mixture. So from hedge fund strategies, we've been looking for man or looking, we've been, you know, spending a bunch of time with managers we know, as well as trying to meet new managers who we think are really good at shorting or who are really good at, who have shown, you know, an ability in the past to cycle to really interesting things when the opportunities present themselves and sort of, you know, are willing to kind of move their exposure. And then also the fixed income portfolio was much more really equity beta type exposure. And so we've built some resiliency there and put, you know, some sovereigns and some things that hopefully should be a little bit of diversification. What was easier than you thought it was going to be when you showed up? Even though a big reason I was comfortable taking the job was based on the people I knew who were on the investment committee. I would still say that has been easier, more fun 
then you know I you know this this model that we all live with in terms of governance structures and you know the CNF sort of interesting you report to a board there are various levels at Carnegie. We took every decision to the board. Here we are taking every decision to the board. And I actually, I was, I'm completely comfortable with that because these, this board wasn't used to having those sorts of decisions close to them. And so I really want the investment committee to know what we're investing in so that they're, they can have steady hands when things are more challenging. That interaction with them has it's been wonderful. It's really been wonderful. They've, they've asked the right questions. They've pushed us on the right things. They, you know, they come having read the, the materials and, and asking really good questions, just pushing us on things that we should be thinking about. And so that I have really loved. And that's been easier, you know, because I, that, that's always sort of an unknown when you go into one of these circumstances. And, and my own personal opinion, the, the governance structure is the Achilles heel of this industry frankly, that some of the biggest mistakes that some of our peers have made have been because of the governance structures and because the governance structure has panicked at the wrong time. And there, there have been a number of reasons why they've panicked at the wrong time because And do you think that's a lack managed. of shared information? I think some people who come into this industry who haven't been in this industry before may not appreciate the extent to which you really, really, really need to be communicating with your governance structure and understanding who's anxious and who needs maybe more handholding and who needs a call or two before you actually are sitting in the meeting. And I just, I think people underappreciate that if you haven't grown up in this. And, and it's a hard, actually, even if you've grown up in this, I think it's a hard skill to develop because it is, it's not investing. It's, it's much more interpersonal dynamics. And I think, you know, the people who've had the most success have, have not only been good investors, but they've been able to manage those dynamics so that they are in a position to do really interesting stuff when real interesting stuff happens, which tends to be when people are most anxious. So what's been much harder than you thought it was going to be? In some ways, it's sort of related to this. It's not, as I said, I love the investment committee has been absolutely wonderful and supportive and so great to work with. I hadn't thought as much about what it would be like to work for a church. (laughs) That's just, (laughs) that's been hard. And I think... What's an example of that? Well, here's how I'll, I think in some ways it may be more comparable to a university endowment in that... The people, everyone, the, the, your stakeholders, broadly speaking, have a very personal commitment to the institution, right? Because they either went there, in the case of a university, or here, they've chosen to come here. It is the center of their spiritual life. That's like a very deeply held important thing. And so, so they have really strong opinions and they want to be heard. Absolutely rightly so. And, you know, they want to feel that they've been a part of the process. And, and so I've, in addition to trying to have sort of the, the um, sensitivity of working with the investment committee, I think I've had to take it a step further and sort of, how would this look on the cover of XYZ newspaper or whatever the case may be? Okay, let's get in front of that. Let's think about that. Who, who might be upset about this? How do we craft the narrative so that people understand what we're trying to accomplish? Let's do a little lightning round with a couple of (laughs) hot hot topics in investing and allocation today. How do you think about co-investments? So we did a ton of work on this at Carnegie, actually, um, and and tried to be very thoughtful um, and talked to a bunch of our peers in the industry. I'm not a huge fan, I got to say. Maybe the data is changing, at least at that point in time. So this is a few years old now. The historical data on co-investments is they are pro-cyclical and they don't turn out well. So if you do it as an asset class, that's not one way to do it. So pro-cyclical in terms of the timing of them, or is it? Yeah, is it, that, is there also the more, adverse selection? More of- in co-investment tends to happen at the end of a cycle when things are really hot and more bigger dollars, more more like opportunities themselves in number, all of it. And it just conspires to not great returns from a dollar perspective. You, if you look at it all, sort of massive dollars. Right. And so... Okay, so that's one thing. And would you take that to the next step, which is to say when you're seeing more co-investments, that's the time to dial down the size of your private equity allocations? Yeah, I think so, that's fair. But that, that's harder to do, right? It is harder because to do. Because you absolutely, to the extent you can control it, should be dialing down the size of your, your private equity commitments. And then we did actually try, we, we sort of came up with a formula to, to build that into the process at Carnegie in terms of 
it sort of did the opposite in terms of what you think you should be putting to work versus what the market's doing and to try and build that in, that discipline in. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You should be doing less. And then what you're already in, you're already in and you can't really yeah. control. You, you, you can be on top of your managers, but you can't ultimately And how about the resources and capabilities of the so team to value? The way it relates to, at least in our world, I think a lot of endowments and foundations, I think, are fairly thinly staffed. They, they just are. That's sort of the model. <laughs> and, and I think in a model that's thinly staffed, to do it effectively in a way that doesn't strain that model, you have to either decide you do it or you don't. That it's very hard to have adequate resources to truly cherry pick and underwrite all of the co-investments you could see. And so I don't think it works for for a lot of endowments and foundations. I'll be really interested to see how this last couple of years turns out for people. Yeah. Because I know it's it's obviously become a huge thing and maybe the industry's changed and it's just sort of it's become a part of the structure for these lockup vehicles that there just will be co investment. Okay. Hedge fund returns gross of fees versus the S&P 500 for the next 10 years, you are betting against Warren Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done, I'm, so you're betting I against him now. I never would have taken that bet, that's <laughs> um, I know why you did it, but I, I, <laughs> I'm too much of a, uh, a, a fatalist and the worst happens once you've, you've put it out there. Into well, the <laughs> it certainly did, but let's, let's leave that aside. Right, so right, right, gross right. of fees. For a whole class, I, I, I think for a whole class, hedge funds, it's like private equity. You wouldn't do it if you were going to invest in the whole class. For what we'll do in hedge funds, I hope we're, we're looking for high single digits. Net, yeah. actually. High right. single digits net. So somewhere low double digits gross. I think that beats the S&P. So we'll see what happens. How do you think about something new like Bitcoin and <laughs> cryptocurrencies? I love it when someone like Jamie Dimon says, <laughs> this is like a tempest in a teapot. I, I don't know. I really don't. You know, I think you you read as much as you can get your hands on. You hope that someone you think is really smart does even more of that reading and then writes it up really well and and stay on top of it. I'm not going to be the vanguard in terms of what I would do directly in any of that. I would hope maybe we have a handful of managers who I think are really smart and thoughtful about the Vanguard and we'll put some money there so we'll have some exposure to it but and we'll learn from them. Yeah. What risk are you most concerned about in the markets? A, just the ridiculous amounts of capital and and what that's leading to in terms of risk taking. And this is sort of related to that. I think there's more leverage in the market than pe people realize. And we just, no one has yet sort of cogently spoken about it, but there's, it's a lot of little things that actually together add up to a lot. And so, you know, like all this stuff with the, with private equity funds using their lines of credit, but keeping them outstanding for longer periods of time. Yeah. Like, I think that's much more significant than people How, realize. How did that start? I've just been hearing about it recently. Yeah, no, I've just been hearing about it recently, too. And, you know, there were a bunch of, a bunch of real estate firms got crushed by this during the crisis. So that was just why I can't believe people are doing this. <laughs> but I think that could be ugly. What's the difference in your day-to-day -day doing this work in downtown Manhattan <laughs> compared to midtown Manhattan? It's a lot of traveling back and forth on the subway to Midtown. <laughs> but you know what? In some ways, actually, it's also it's fun to be down here. You know, our real estate is close to here. And so that's really nice to feel. I mean, this neighborhood is a totally different neighborhood. This is the neighborhood where I started my career. 25 years ago. <laughs> and it was a totally different neighborhood then. It was dead at night. It was dead on the weekends. And so to be here and see how much it's changed and there's families and there's a lot more residential and and to be with Trinity Church, which is such a core part of that. And, you know, one of our big areas of focus is creating neighborhoods and communities. And so that's really motivating. And so it's sort of it's it's that's really nice in terms of being down. Yeah. Here. Well, let's turn to a few closing questions. Yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite thing to do that is a complete waste of time? 
I spend way too much time reading articles, <laughs> you know, sitting on my phone and reading random researchy articles that there, there's some great article that's going to be in the New York Times this weekend about research in, in the social psychology space and all this sort of drama that's going on there and whether it's real research or not and whether it's been adequately tested. And like, I love that sort of stuff and just thinking about there's always more reading to do than I ever have time to do, which and that's my English major. Once I'm done here, that's that's all I'll do. I'll just sit and read, read books, read magazines, read articles, newspapers. What teaching from your parents most stayed with you? I think the biggest is how you treat people and just treat people the way you want them to treat you. Um, and that <laughs> is so important in everything, in how we work as a team and how we work with the people we're partnered with. It's not just sort of a, how you go about your day-to-day life. It's really like it's at the core of how we, um, I think, how we ultimately can punch above our weight in terms of being a thinly staffed team, but hopefully getting access to really interesting opportunities. And so, you know, we... We want to be open and transparent and fair and not mislead. And so all of those things are kind of treating people the way you want them to treat you. Yeah, that's great. What information or column do you regularly read that other people might not know about? I see, the, the st- well, the, the, all that stuff. I don't know that I necessarily, you know, like I like Michael Sembolist's research a lot. Michael Sembolist, I like, he does a bunch of kind of macro research at J.P. Morgan. I like that. And it tends to be kind of broad ranging in terms of the topics that he covers. So that's kind of fun. I've always loved the GavCal research. Uh, I just I like the fact that they all totally disagree with each other, but all do it in a really kind of thoughtful way, I think. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot younger? That there are a lot of different ways to make money. I may not be as good at some of them. <laughs> but I think, you know, when I was younger, I thought that that uh, the way I knew how to make money was sort of the only way to make money. And I think it, uh, it kept me from learning as much from other people as I could have along the way and listening as well as perhaps I could have along the way. And so I hope, you know, I... I definitely feel like that is something that's changed over the course of my life in terms of being opening and understanding. I still may not necessarily feel comfortable that I can <laughs> do it in any way, but I do feel like there, I have a lot to learn from other people. And I found, you know, at Carnegie too, I found, we tr- we really tried to to put together a team of people who brought very different strengths and different ways of making money, and we felt that that was to the benefit of the larger portfolio. And so that's something I try, and I probably wouldn't have done that as much earlier in my career. Yeah. All right, it's your waning days. You are reading your favorite book <laughs> in a rocking chair, 98 <laughs> years old. What advice would you give yourself today? Take a deep breath. <laughs> just, just take a deep breath. Don't over get, and over yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't worry about it. Just, you know, you'll figure it out. Take the time to figure it out. Don't feel like you need to, to solve it right this second. Take some time to think about it. Take a deep breath. Fantastic. Yeah. Meredith, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you've liked what you've heard, please write a review on iTunes or Google Play to help others find out about the show. Have a good one and see you next time. Thank you.